Okay, I think we'll, we'll get started, Nick. Firstly, right. uh, uh, welcome everyone to the Scotland Data Science and Technology Meetup. Uh, this this event is actually part of FinTech Scotland. And uh, Nick, we welcome Nick again to the hot seat. It's good to have you on board again and, and listen to you again, Nick. I think you were one of the first people to present as soon as lockdown started. Well, so, as right. I said earlier, it would be nice to have been doing this in, in person to to an audience tonight, but we are where we are. Where we are. So, Nick, welcome. Uh, really looking forward tonight. I'll, I'll, I'll hand it straight over to you, Nick. But sit back okay. and relax, and I'll come I'll in after your talk of the Q&A. Thanks, Nick. That sounds good. Well, um, evening. Uh, yes, as uh, I didn't realize I was one of the first to uh, do kind of lockdown presentation, but um, I must admit, I'm somebody who prefers to move around, um, and at this time of night, also maybe have a beer. So um, uh, this is kind of doubly constrained for me. Um, but anyway, uh, I hope this is going to be entertaining uh, and um, uh, possibly stimulating as well. Um, this is the first time I've given this talk and um, who knows, maybe it'll be the last. Um, but uh, this was a kind of a, a creative way of looking at analytics that I hope you will find, uh, first of all, entertaining because it's six o'clock on a Thursday night. Um, but perhaps more seriously, might stimulate some ideas um, in the Q&A uh, and generate some discussion. Um, afterwards. This is kind of based on, um, I'll give you a bit of background later on me, but based on about 20 years of experience, both helping clients with analytics, but also running analytics teams um, within uh, within different businesses. But um, let me start with, because it's always good practice, just kind of start with a bit of audience engagement, although I won't ask questions of the audience. Um, let me start with a quick question, which is, um, uh, what do these four inventions have in common? So I won't pause for answers from the chat because um, then you you risk a tumbleweed moment where nobody responds. But um, so I will give you the answer in just a moment. Um, given this is Scottish fintech week, you know one obvious answer um, should be they were all invented in Scotland. But um, sorry to disappoint you. I know that the the number of inventions that come out of Scotland is pretty enormous. But um, actually, I don't think these ones are. Um, I think the uh, the helicopter is uh, was invented by a Russian. The parachute by a, a Frenchman um, and the uh, uh, the gun, the machine gun, probably by a um, an American called Gatling, um, and the tank has lots of different um, uh, inventors. But um, my favourite, and according to Wikipedia, um, the tank was invented by a, a guy called Lancelot de Mole. What a great name! Lancelot de Mole invented the tank. I think we should give it to him just for just for the name. Um, but the thing they do have in common, and those of you who kind of um, uh, were eagle-eyed and read the title of the um, uh, talk might be well ahead of uh, everybody else. Um, they were all first conceived by Leonardo da Vinci. These are all things that um, this amazing painter, uh, born more than 500 years ago, um, had come up with, with an idea around. He had this amazing rotary flying machine, this incredible hut on wheels that you could use for, um, for fighting wars. Um, a parachute which, whilst Leonardo never tested it, has actually been tested and did actually work despite being made out of a combination of fabric and, um, and wood. Uh, and this amazing, what looks like a water wheel, but is actually Leonardo's con uh, uh, conceived um, uh, machine gun. So Leonardo was just an extraordinary man, as, and of course, as well as um, uh, an, an extraordinary painter, um, he's given us some of the most famous paintings, um, uh, even people who aren't art historians like me would know and recognize, um, he, including the most expensive uh, painting ever, so the Salvador Mundi, which sold for about 450 million last year, um, million dollars. Um, uh, an extraordinary man, but not just a painter, um, a bit of an inventor. And in fact, one of his, um, hopefully everybody recognizes this picture, or at least a snapshot of a picture. One of the things that was amazing about the Mona Lisa is um, uh, Leonardo dissected probably more cadavers, more bodies than uh, uh, your, your average doctor. Um, he really got into human anatomy as a lot of his artwork showed. Um, but in particular for the Mona Lisa, um, it, was, it was famous that he, um, uh, he was dissecting um, the, the faces, the muscles and the nerves around the lips and, and, and he was dissecting human eyes in order to, to feed that into his art, feed that into some of these pictures, uh, these uh, amazing paintings that he, that he created. Um, so a truly, um, uh, a true kind of Renaissance man, to use the phrase, 
um, and somebody that kind of really blended both his art and his science. And this was sort of, this was the, 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 um, the setting for, for this talk, um, which was, um, uh, I think, a theme uh, that uh, certainly the team I left the last six years um, very much kind of glommed onto, which is this idea of this kind of sort of an artistic side to some of the things, some of the disciplines in um, the analytics and insights world. And there's certainly um, some heavy duty data science um, in, uh, approaches that are emerging. Um, and one of the things that we worked on, and I wanted to share a few of the sort of projects that uh, we did this on and some of the thinking behind it, um, was this idea of blending these two things together. Um, perhaps, I, I think, more than many than a lot of companies do, but part of the feedback session for, the, for this talk, I think would be, it'd be good to hear whether this resonates, is obvious, is something you've seen, or whether this is uh, thinking that uh, kind of is, 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 is stimulates you to do different things. But some of these um, sort of emerging concepts around analytics um, and putting them together into more of a multidisciplinary approach was definitely a, a theme of, of uh, certainly the team I led for the last six years and some of the work I've done with, uh, done with clients. So a little bit about me. Um, as I said, uh, uh, 20 years plus um, helping build analytics and insights capability. I am a long-term geek. Um, uh, I think I had my first computer when I was 17, and it was 64K, um, which I worked out the other day is a million times smaller than the um, than my iPhone. So there you go. There's progress for you. Um, I, I'm a uh, side life as an engineer. Uh, I'm an enthusiastic cook, so that's my creative outlet is in, is in cooking. Uh, but I spent a lot of time as a strategy consultant and uh, kind of leading analytics teams. Um, my technology career started a long time ago um, uh, in 82, and, and it kind of more from uh, technology into actual consulting and data-driven strategies uh, has been more strategy and business-led since, since then. So I've kind of built strategies, built data strategies, built customer strategies, um, and then kind of led analytics and insights teams within, uh, within clients and within businesses. Um, and the last six years I've spent leading um, uh, the analytics and data science team at uh, Barclays, uh, the retail bank, um, and in fact, we're doing that within something called the information business, which is a, um, which was Barclays' uh, foray into how can I create a, um, a commercial business out of some of the information that I sit on um, as a bank in a way that is um, uh, aggregates and anonymizes that data and then uses that for insight that might be valuable to um, customers, to uh, uh, clients, uh, uh, and to um, and, and to kind of users of the banking services, um, and so that that business was um, uh, one where we were basically building products and services based on um, the information content of the banking transaction, if you like. Um, and I and I uh, did that up until about February this year, um, and one of the things I'm doing right now is helping establish something called the Global Open Finance Center which um, those of you uh, in the fintech world uh, may have heard of, um, but uh, Gofco, as it's uh, fondly called, um, is all about setting up um, a data haven, a source of data, a little bit like uh, we were using at Barclays, which is um, drawing on some of the open banking and open finance data that's now out there and looking for ways of combining that data uh, in a safe way um, so that we can use it to deliver social economic benefit through, uh, through data science and analytics. So that's sort of me. Um, uh, what about you? Um, as in, uh, who's this for? Um, uh, and if this isn't you, then um, uh, I'm, I may lose you at this point. Um, but I, I'm thinking you might be one of, fall into one of these three categories. So um, one is maybe you're running a business with data science and analytics kind of at its core, um, given this is FinTech week and perhaps many of you are uh, closely connected with that kind of sector, that seems quite um, a good bet. You might, like me, be leading a team of analysts and data scientists um, or insights uh, professionals. Um, or you might be an individual consultant or professional who's just passionate about the analysis profession um, and your personal impact. I, I hope that if you're any of those, fall in any of those three categories, there's something here that will kind of uh, stimulate you. Um, but I use the word impact and kind of that's the starting point um, for the talk. Um, it's the jumping off point um, and uh, hopefully a, a fairly non-controversial um, point, but um, from our perspective, it's the impact that matters. Um, it's all about uh, 
good analytics, better analytics is about um, analytics that has impact. And whilst I've done a lot of my work, uh, most of my work in the private sector, I don't want you to think that, that impact means um, pounds and pence necessarily. So um, if you're in the public sector, I think you can create analytics impact through um, your work leading to improvements in wellness, in uh, schemes to help reduce public spending, in things that might help employment or pension contributions. In the private sector, yes, it might be about profitability or increasing customer engagement. Um, it might be reducing your use of capital. And even in the third sector, um, social impact is measurable um, and uh, you can help optimize how, how good your return on contributions are and how good you're achieved in certain targets you might have. All of these constitute an impact. And the contention is not a controversial one, I think. The contention is um, we should strive to have more impact with the analytics we're doing. And so, so one question is how might you do that? Or, or what might you want to be thinking about in order if that is your goal? So here's a slide that falls in the category of a statement of the bleeding obvious, but um, let's, let's, uh, let's run with it. Um, impact um, uh, can lead to, uh, we get an impact when something happens, when a change happens, when somebody takes an action. So these are things that create an impact. If it's a customer, um, I want the customer to, to buy my service or to use my product. And an action or change happens when um, one of these two things happen. Um, this is a gross simplification, but um, I think for the purposes of, kind of just structuring our thoughts today, this is, kind of, this is a kind of helpful way of, of, of breaking it into two problems. One is um, we either, um, uh, impact either means a client or a customer or employee or a citizen does something different. Um, so we actually cause a customer to change their behavior. Um, or if we're leading some kind of uh, project that seeks to find a different answer, it's when somebody changes their mind, when a sponsor, an owner, a board member, or a leader of the business or our client uh, changes their mind or makes a choice, decides to do something different. That's when an impact or a change happens. And um, uh, that means that to have that impact, we've got to affect people. We've actually got to get people to change something, either change their mind, change their mind. And why is that a problem? Um, well, I would quote one of the uh, a famous Leonardo of our times. Um, people are a problem. Um, they uh, have their own will and they uh, decide to do their own thing and they are difficult to uh, uh, get them to change their behavior or change their habits. People are difficult and therefore that often makes our ability to have an impact difficult. So if we think about um, how do I get people to change their behavior or change their mind, um, I think that might be a useful lens with which we could look at how might a multidisciplinary approach, how might bringing more disciplines into our pure world of analytics help us do that and therefore help us have more impact. So let's talk about changing customer behaviors. Um, I'll start with a story, um, start with a story from, uh, from the banking past um, here's something that uh, would be really good um, from a banking perspective and certainly a problem that we spent time uh, focusing on. And the question is, could you help people avoid accidental overdrafts? So there's an important behavior change. 26 million people use an overdraft every year. Um, even with the recent um, uh, uh, regulatory actions on, on uh, overdraft pricing, uh, it's still around 40% APR, one of the worst ways to borrow. Um, but more importantly, more interestingly for uh, this example is the bank often knows you're about to go overdrawn. That's not a hard bit of predictive analytics to do. Um, there's a, a predictable pattern in a, a lot of customer spending. You can see anomalous uh, payments out of the account. So, um, uh, without much hard modeling, you could certainly produce a pretty reliable signal that says, you know what, I think this customer at least has a higher risk of going overdrawn next week. So could we help people avoid accidental overdrafts, which would be good for the customer um, and uh, would help us uh, more easily uh, create better customer outcomes um, in terms of uh, their borrowing behavior? The answer is yes for a few. 
Um, and, and the reason is, and, and so one of the things we did was um, targeted and tested a set of SMS interventions. So just sent uh, customers where we thought there was a likelihood that they were likely to go overdrawn. Uh, we sent them a, a, an intervention. You may have seen similar from your own bank that just said, that just says uh, funds are low. Uh, there might be a chance that you go overdrawn. Um, you might want to uh, look at your account and look at your, uh, look at your balances. Um, uh, and the result of that was very interesting when we kind of tested that and uh, under a bunch of variations and created quite a granular analysis um, of the kind of results from a set of randomized control tests you ended up finding there were groups of customers that responded very um, uh, significantly, um, did all the right, did, did all the things that um, avoided going in overdraft and therefore it was a very successful intervention. Um, uh, we managed to uh, avoid them uh, going, going overdrawn. Um, and then the others for which it hadn't had really had uh, no impact. Um, and you might say at first glance that, well, you know, why don't you just tell anybody anyway, what's the harm in, uh, What's the harm in just warning people? Um, doesn't really matter. Uh, but actually, it, it, it is harmful uh, sending an SMS which is useless to a customer um, simply because if you start sending too much noise to customers with telling them about too many things, then there's a high chance that uh, they'll start to switch off and they'll start to ignore things like SMSs or indeed uh, opt out of SMS, which means you then lose the ability to tell them about things that are important. So it is actually quite important to find um, that sweet spot of customers for which this kind of intervention is effective. Um, so uh, one of the things this was able to do is uh, by doing that granular analysis, we then created a very tight targeting for some follow-up surveys that led to a far better understanding of why this worked with some customers and why it didn't work with others, which allowed us kind of who to allowed us to select people for this intervention and allowed us then to find other areas where we need to hunt for new interventions. So this is a simple example where we kind of tied together analytics, bit of testing, um, and then some very targeted uh, insights work to um, find a much better um, overall um, insight into uh, what we needed to do from a, from a, from a um, intervention perspective. I've used the phrase analytics and insights, just a little bit of terminology. Um, you may think of these things, these definitions are very different. This is kind of how we thought of the world. Um, and this is important for when I talk about melding these things together, you'll see why I, I, I kind of think of them in a slightly different way. So from an analytics perspective, or maybe data science or business intelligence, um, a lot of different phrases. Um, I'm talking about those methodologies which are often concerned with, okay, what happened? What might happen? Who did this? What did they do? So we're, we're creating some, using data to create some very specific objective in, um, uh, uh, um, findings around uh, those sort of questions. And I'm making that distinction between what I'm calling insights, some might call market research, custom research, survey, customer surveys, a whole host of things that you'll find in typical consumer facing businesses, where there the question is much more concerned with, so why did this happen? Um, you know, what was, what was the motivation of the customer? What was it they intended to do, maybe, rather than actually what they did? What was expected? by the customer of the service? Um, and most importantly, what might change things for them? So the, I think there's a sort of distinction between um, these kind of, these uh, sort of two, two uh, if you like, uh, classes of discipline. And my observation, really interested in your feedback um, uh, at the end of this, my observation is typically those teams sit in very different parts of the organization. They didn't um, at Barclays, and I think that was one of the, big, big um, opportunities we had. We were able to kind of sit them together and, and actually start blending the skills between the teams. But they're often not only the different parts of the organization, sometimes they serve different functions. So sometimes insights is kind of, it's part of marketing or part of customer strategy. And, and the analytics team might be sitting in a strategy unit or might be sitting in a tech unit or, or under finance. Um, so they're often very different, not just different disciplines, but different teams. Um, and that actually has some unfortunate uh, consequences or can have. So you can be briefed by different parts of the organization and operated separately. They may end up working on different problems. Um, teams might even compete, um, not even directly, but, but sometimes for, for very sort of um, implicit things like um, the attention of the board. So um, if you're kind of competing for attention, competing for a message, and if you're working on things that are related and you're coming up with slightly different answers, 
it can be very, um, uh, it can really slow down decision making as opposed to help decision making. I think crucially, and I think this is the bit that um, I would uh, um, ask people to reflect on, neither discipline is really benefiting from the insights of the other. And that was the thing that we were trying to fix. Um, and so there's an opportunity, uh, which we took um, certainly um, uh, in Barclays, took advantage of, which is to structure projects to integrate the work from both those disciplines. And when I talk about those disciplines, I kind of the left-hand page, the left-hand side of this slide just shows a few kind of buzzwords around interesting topics and interesting new techniques we were trying to explore in those different areas. Uh, the insights team were playing with ethnography. Um, they had a really interesting online digital uh, panel. We had a huge amount of in-moment surveys we could use. And the analytics side of the house, the data scientists were um, looking at the impact of, of graph analytics, uh, natural language processing. We were building kind of Bayesian testing models. So there were not just there were um, projects we could combine on, but there were new techniques being kind of explored by both teams. And one of the questions we asked was, how might we start to mold these together? And one of the, I think the biggest sort of aha moments was, if you can do this and you can create projects where the flow of work uses both these disciplines, then one step can hand off sharper questions to the other. So if you want to know why a customer might be um, not using this product product correctly. Um, you can do some general surveying about what they think of this product and what their needs might be. But a more powerful question would be to do some analysis to really figure out what's the segment or what's the, the type of customer who I, whose behavior I'm really worried about. And then let me go and do some research and some call work with that smaller group. And you can start to get a much sharper uh, set of insights. So a couple of examples. Um, uh, we were a big retail bank, so like many retail banks, multi-product, multi-segment, multi-channel. So when you talk about things like customer journeys, um, huge journey complexity, huge difficulty in sort of understanding those things. And we had, even when you kind of boiled it down to um, uh, quite high level journeys, uh, I, I think at one point over 180 different journeys you could spend time thinking about when you cut across all of those combinations of product, segment, and channel. Um, and a lot of these were tracked with um, a number of surveys, including MPS. MPS is the one I'm talking about in this particular project. So we were able to kind of find the top, rather than trying to handle that 180 and, and, and all at once, which would have um, just been, um, uh, you couldn't have got the organization to focus on anything uh, like that number. We could kind of find the top hotspot journeys based on some plates, journey failures, um, and uh, kind of MPS scoring. And then one of the things we were doing, again, I said we were, the team was playing with things like um, natural language processing. We used that to um, look at some of the MPS commentary and create areas of MPS commentary that were, um, were kind of hotspot areas that we needed to, 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 to dig into. And not just defining problem areas, but showed us spikes or high volumes or new anomalies that might be emerging. Um, so this allowed us to kind of use journey analysis, then really pinpoint key um, combinations of a certain moment, a certain segment, a certain journey. This is something that we really need to fix, or this is something that's become a problem right, uh, lately. So it created a great triage, um, triage of, of, of where we might want to focus. Um, Another one, again, this is, um, I, I think, um, a number of people, um, a number of, uh, I've done this with a number of clients, so I don't think this is particularly groundbreaking, um, but it, it worked really effectively here, which was um, where we combine some behavioral modeling with um, some simple conjoint analysis. So the problem here was to create, um, uh, we were introducing a loyalty scheme, um, like many banks, we had a, um, a loyalty scheme with a kind of complex trade-off of this, this product rewards, there's points rewards, there's fees and there's rebates and there's cash back and all of the kind of uh, elements in that mix. Um, and we had done a lot of qualitative research to determine what, what those scheme elements could be. Um, but you then needed to, before we could launch this thing, you then needed to um, figure out, well, okay, so what is the, what is the exact right um, trade-off between, you know, what the customer earns, what they burn in terms of points, what we, uh, uh, what we will charge for that, um, what kind of discounts will we give, and that's quite a complex economic uh, economic uh, problem to model. So 
um, having done a, um, a little bit of qualitative research, we then kind of went into some conjoint, which where we actually did quantitative research to understand the value of the trade-offs the customers make. Um, and that gave us some um, really good customer level kind of elasticity of behaviors, which we could then um, essentially build a model of, um, of what this scheme would look like when it was introduced. And actually that's what we did. And, and we modeled the entire customer base. So this was a, um, a, a really good bottom up view of these are the likely economics that are going to emerge from this, uh, this loyalty scheme. And which then allows us to do some scenario analysis, i.e. You know, stress test some certain assumptions um, to find um, an optimal kind of feature price combination, which you could then test um, in terms of final proposition with a bit of qualitative research to kind of understand, okay, this is what the whole thing looks like. Do the customers get it? Is it easy to understand? And what kind of questions do they ask? Um, and that allowed us to have a pinpointed product, pinpointed offer, um, and, and a set of pinpointed segments to, to go after. So another way, which is another way of kind of finding this is the group of people that uh, we want to we want to target in terms of behavior change. In this case, the behavior change was take up the uh, take up the loyalty scheme. And a third, just last example, um, and this one was more proposed. This is more um, uh, one we were playing with, um, uh, and uh, uh, and in fact, as, as I left, so um, I don't think we actually ever ever did this. So uh, I can't tell you the experience of whether this worked, but. Uh, it was an exciting construct of projects. We'd done a whole bunch of things around building models of um, customer level models around engagement, around lifetime value. Um, and uh, we ended up thinking about this, um, a really interesting uh, construction of, of, of work around how we might want to create almost like a behaviors map across the whole base of here's the behavior we want to manage over the next three to four years. Um, so we segmented the base based partially on, on a number of things, but one of the elements of it was how engaged is the customer? So engagement for us was how deeply they use the product, um, you know, whether they interacted with us on channel, are they, are they digital or not? Um, these are all kind of complex mixes of engagement. And we had created a, an engagement score, so that, um, which was a sort of synthetic score that tracked to things like share of wallet, NPS, uh, satisfaction. So it tracked to some measures that we think high score means customer likes us and we um, we have a great relationship with the customer but it was essentially a synthetic measure based on all sorts of different measures of of interact customer interaction um, and uh, the analytics guys were able to model that and project that over time uh, using Markov chain to figure out how a customer moves from state to state and how that engagement might move they could create a, a pretty sound model that said um, here's the customer base today, and this is the kind of state they're in in terms of engagement. Just based on uh, current experiences, how I think the, the base will be in a, uh, you know, in a few months' time, in a few quarters' time, in a, in a few years' time. Um, one of the things that then gave us was an incredibly um, a good view of, okay, so these are the changes in engagement, and these are the flows of customers that are really important to our economics. Because when you combine how engagement is going to flow with the lifetime value of those customers you get to the point where you say good heavens this group of customers changing in this way could really have a beneficial impact on on our economics or a beneficial impact on our engagement beneficial impact on uh, vulnerable customers getting into a better position for example these are some flows we need to really focus on so it gave us um, some ideas around behaviors that shifted the conversation from something as pretty sort of superficial as, oh, I wish I could get more customers, you know, engaged on the mobile app, which is pretty obvious stuff and, and not very targeted to, okay, there's a group of people who are in a professional segment, they have low assets with us, they have a high advocacy of the bank, and I see them disengaging from the mobile app. Why are they doing that? And how can I in interact? And how can I interrupt that disengagement? Because um, uh, those are the people I really need to, uh, really need to tackle. And one of the things that this could do, and as I said, this is a, a kind of proposed model of how we might combine these, it could kind of create a, a playbook, if you like, of priority flows of customers, where we can say, these are the flows of customers we need to accelerate, and these are the, the disengagement, the, the bad flows we need to, um, we need to uh, stem. So I hope it gives, gives you some thoughts around, we were molding different disciplines um, and using that to find, if you like, a sweet spot um, a group of people where we know the behavior we want to change, 
um, and that would just to do the hard job of changing that behavior. So how do you do that? I hope none of you speed. It's a very naughty habit. Um, and of course, now we're on lockdown, nobody's speeding anyway right now. Um, but I'm sure you're all aware of multiple um, techniques used um, to help indicate, uh, to help us slow down and manage our speeding. It might be lines on the road like this, or, line, or, or lines that get closer and closer together as you get close to a roundabout. Um, there's a village apparently in, uh, in Norfolk where they've actually planted an avenue of trees where the trees get closer together as you get into the village. And the idea is to give the driver the impression that they're speeding up when in fact they might even be decelerating, but it's all to give you feedback that uh, you might be going faster than you think. There was a wonderful, um, about 10 years ago, a wonderful um, fun theory contest that resulted in something called a speed camera lottery. Um, uh, I think in uh, one of the Scandinavian countries, a guy called Kevin Richardson came up with this idea that you put a speed camera at a, a problematic corner and you end up with, um, and, and, you, and you run the, you, you, you photograph the number plate as, as you would do with any speed camera. But the, the slight twist is they actually photographed every number plate um, and, and passing this uh, speed camera automatically entered you for a lottery. Um, and the, uh, um, the, the, the winner, the, the people who um, were obeying the speed limit or going under the speed limit um, entered the lottery. And uh, the prize was the proceeds of the people who had broken the speed limit. So a wonderful carrot and stick, which is you know, not only do you have an opportunity to um, uh, be fined, which is sort of the, uh, the usual stick we're all used to with speed cameras in this country, but uh, um, here was an interesting carrot incentive as well. Um, and it worked well. It, uh, it uh, did, uh, was very effective at uh, reducing speed. So an interesting way of, of kind of creating behavior change. A couple of examples from the UK, um, the one on the left, uh, pretty obvious, but what, a, what an interesting way, a, a clever gamification way of getting people to dispose of their uh, cigarette butts, maybe a thing of the past, I hope, but cigarette butts or, 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 um, or uh, litter, I don't really care which, but this was one, one way of uh, getting people to vote with their cigarette butts and therefore not throw them on the floor. So a kind of a mundane example, but an effective one. Um, and then on the right, automatic pensions enrollment. I'm sure many people know about that. Um, and that, that can be life changing. Um, and there's a, a, a way of changing people's behavior um, that uh, has made a huge difference to the pensions habit and the saving habit of people in the UK. So again, a small thing, in this case, automatic enrollment was nothing more than shifting from something that you would normally choose to opt into to get people to choose to opt out of um, and the default being an opt in. Um, but had a dramatic, a dramatic impact on, uh, on pensions enrollment. And these are all, and those of you who kind of know the theory, um, these are all examples of things called nudges. Um, uh, and nudges have been around for about a decade now, um, and it's starting to get used in all sorts of different fields. Um, and there is, uh, there's a unit at number 10 called the nudge unit, um, uh, which a guy called David Halpin wrote a very interesting book about. Um, and they define interventions as things that are, they're interventions that are easy and cheap to avoid. So they're not things that um, really force you to do anything. They're things that persuade you. Um, and uh, the concept of the nudge was, came up by these guys, uh, Thaler and Sunstein. And uh, the idea was, um, uh, it was drawing on the ideas of behavioral economics and the ways that we think and the ways that we behave and trying to create a, a set of um, ideas that would allow us to, um, as, as I say, create these nudges to um, help persuade people to change their behavior. And the nudge is somewhat, um, uh, a somewhat contrived acronym, but um, the way that uh, Thaler and Sunstein put it is, um, uh, the A is for incentives, so the, the, the lottery example before um, with our traffic lottery, the kind of gamification or some kind of incentive to get people to change their behavior, pretty obvious. Um, the U is for kind of understanding, uh, they called it understanding mappings. This is nothing more than trying to present a, a choice for us that might be really complicated for us to relate to, but relating it to something that is much more relatable. In the finance world, um, a classic example would be the kind of insistence the regulator had around um, standard APRs, standard AERs. So let's put something that's complex to um, for consumers to calculate into language that is uh, normalized and easy for them to compare. Defaults and obvious, the pensions example, the pensions example is, is a good one of those. So give people 
the easy route through. Um, the default is the thing they might want to choose. Give feedback. Why on earth does the iPhone camera make a shutter noise? Well, it's great feedback. It tells you you've taken the picture. It doesn't need to make a shutter noise, but it gives you, it, uh, it's a good way of nudging to say that you've completed the task. Um, the E was for expecting people when they're making these decisions, which tend to be done quickly and, uh, um, uh, I wouldn't say under pressure, but, but often quickly and without much thinking, errors will be made. So um, how can you build the choice? How can you build a process? How can you build a nudge around things that will anticipate that error and correct for it? Classic one, as I'm sure everybody's aware of in your ATM, you know, you always get your card back before you get your cash. Why? Because if you've got your cash back, that's the thing you're focused on. I want to get 40 quid out. I want to get 100 quid out. Once you're in that, that's in your hand, you know, temptation is to walk off and you might leave the card. So the card gets fed back to you first before you get the thing that you're, you're focused on. And the last one um, is a really interesting one um, around uh, one way we can uh, nudge people, again, is a little bit like the defaults idea, is making it easy, making there's an easy flow through the decision-making process, in which case, can we structure choices, make it easy for people to, to do the thing we want them to do um, uh, by helping them structure or plan a choice. Um, and an obvious answer you see around you all the time these days is kind of uh, collaborative filtering. So um, if I'm trying to search for something, if one of the things I'm being fed with is either high recommendation items in the thing I'm searching for, or things that people like me have bought before, or things like people who have bought this product will have bought before, that's a way of structuring the choice that makes it easier for me to make a decision and therefore more likely to nudge me to, in this stage, in this case, you know, pay some more money to Amazon. But you could use it in all sorts of different uh, different sets. But, but some uh, caution. Um, uh, again, those of you who kind of recognize the term nudge will know, will know it's been in the press recently um, and not in the most uh, um, uh, greatest like the uh, sort of... Uh, the greatest reputation, um, it was being used by number 10 in the current pandemic. So all these things around singing while washing our hands and um, demonstrating different handshakes and marking the floor were all um, uh, nudges of one sort or another. And um, there was a recent open letter from academics expressing concern about um, some of the nudge thinking that was being applied in government policy. And in particular, there was a big debate around behavioral fatigue, because those of you who read the stories will know that they, um, there was some talk around how we might have adjusted some of our um, reactions to COVID um, because the government was concerned about behavioral fatigue. And the, um, the, the letter from the academics, kind of an important point to make was, it didn't reject the use of behavioral science, um, but it was calling for, well, what's the behavioral evidence? What, what, you know, what are you basing this on? Um, because it's worth really understanding whether it's good policy by looking at that kind of evidence, as opposed to this stuff isn't just kind of, um, subjective theory about you know incentives it actually you know you can you can test this stuff and i guess testing is the is the really key thing because one of the issues behind nudging and here's a story from our own um experience is um there can be some terrible unintended consequences um uh, in, in this case we had a great idea within my team which was we thought we could predict customers who are on the verge of complaining um, and then preempt that complaint um, bringing complaints down was a huge um, um, is a huge issue in any consumer facing company. Um, it's actually a regulatory issue in the, for the banks because the regulator um, puts pressure on them to do more about um, the high number of complaints they had. And it was a it was something we were um, keen to tackle. So the thought was, could you preempt a complaint by finding customers who looked like they were on the point of complaining? Um, and the answer is. The prediction of that, um, in some cases, uh, is is can be very effective. So we found multiple signals that were um, that you could use to uh, spot when something like this is going to happen. Um, for example, a pretty obvious one: customer restarts a process multiple times. Uh, doesn't uh, it's not a doesn't take a, a rocket scientist to figure out that that probably means that they're trying to do something and failing. Um, so is that a good point to intervene? So we kind of developed a complaints algorithm that, that, that measured some of these signals and uh, uh, used that to kind of predict the complainant. Uh, it had very strong predictive power. It worked in the sense that it did indeed spot people who were on the point of complaining. So we rolled it out on a test basis. Um, uh, and, and what we rolled out was 
uh, let's spot these customers, let's intervene with a call, uh, let's see if we can um, help them if they're in trouble or if something's going wrong, um, and with any luck, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of lower complaints. Now, the interesting unintended consequence was um, uh, complaint volumes actually went up in this case. And, and, and the reason was because um, whilst the call worked really well and it was a fantastic um, in, uh, a customer service piece of thing to do, and it was definitely a, a good thing to do from a, um, from a treating customers well and getting, uh, getting improvements in sort of uh, customer satisfaction, um, uh, the fact that you had talked to a customer about is something going on here that might make you uh, that that might uh, be a be a problem um, in that conversation in that dialogue. Um, it's pretty quick for the customer to say yes. I was on the point of complaining, and at that point, if um, if a customer talks about a complaint, we are kind of duty bound to register that as a complaint. So the short term unintended consequence of this, uh, what we thought was a relatively simple nudge, was uh, that uh, it had the reverse effect that we wanted, which complaint volumes actually uh, went up. So what's the answer to that? Um, can, how can you predict that? Um, well, I think that's get, that comes on to something that's really important around behavior change and something at the center of um, our thinking around this, which is around business experimentation. And one of the ways of thinking about um, experimentation in business is um, there's a theory which we then evaluate. Okay, uh, pretty simple. I have an idea, I then go and evaluate it. Um, and, and theories come from a whole bunch of places. I read it in a textbook. It's best practice. It's what people in this industry do. Oh, we had a great idea. Um, we did this pilot and it worked. So let's. Uh, so we think this must this must be good. Um, it's kind of common sense. Uh, so I think it's going to work. And so we do these things. We do these interventions. In this case, maybe some nudges. And then we evaluate them. And we might evaluate them with controlled experiments. We might then do customer research and find out whether they. Uh, this worked. We might do regression models. We might do historical analysis. And I guess one of the things that um, uh, is, I think, an important kind of philosophical um, bent to this is that actually that typical view, there's a better view, which is to say um, all of those things, custom research, reg regression models, historical analysis, whether the pilot works, sound theory, we should think of all of those things as good theory and ways of creating hypotheses but actually our evaluation, because of these complex, complex um, behaviors we have to deal with, because people are complicated people, and because of the dangers of unintended consequences, because you can't be always sure that nudges will work. Actually, controlled experiments are, one of, are really the best and only way, and the kind of gold standard of how, to, um, um, of how to test whether or not things like these behavior changes work. So the kind of real secret behind behavior change is kind of applying all these different theories about how you might want to do it but then using controlled experiment to figure out whether it actually worked. Um, ooh, here we go. Um, and um, so one of the things that uh, we did, um, uh, uh, and I've done that too with a number of clients is um, actually create a pretty rigorous framework around how you run these kind of test and learn experiments. So, uh, and it doesn't require, whilst it describes a bit of science, um, actually, um, a lot of what it is about is is the discipline of um, running tests properly, um, ring fencing resources to analyze the test, having a statistically robust control sample, um, actually making sure um, that uh, having read a test or uh, that you get the decision makers together to agree what's going to be the outcome of the test. Simple things, but running that process around um, test testing and learning from the experiment. Um, is really critical, and you need that kind of that that rhythm set up. Right, I'm going to race ahead. Um, there was a quick example. So, um, so that was kind of customer behavior change. Um, you know, uh, and if you're the business, so one of the things I think that might make you think about is what about your analytics and insights? Do you have analytics and insights? Are they well connected? Do you see them well integrated into the work that's coming out of the analytics uh, function? Do you have a good testing culture? Um, if you're leading a team of those those disciplines, are you defining projects workflows that draw on those disciplines? Um, do your practitioners play nicely together? Because sometimes these disciplines, you know, can uh, can butt heads. Um, uh, and are you able to conduct randomized control trials? And then, from an individual perspective, um, it might be worth you for reflecting on you know other opportunities to kind of understand that wider set of disciplines. Okay, we've got ten more minutes, and I've got about um, half the. Um, I told you I'd only given this once. So I'm just finding I should have done 
more work on uh, timing it. But let's look at the second thing, and we can uh, we can go at, go at this one at speed, um, which is uh, uh, how do I get people to change their minds? How do I? Um, I've got I've got some analytics that um, asks for a different investment uh, profile. It talks about um, an important choice that that you need to make. Um, uh, how can I uh, kind of uh, get people to to actually uh, um, engage with the data and and, uh, and and make a choice? Um, so uh, we could have spent a lot of time on this, but uh, um, we are kind of running running low on time. Um, but uh, as I talk, I put the slide up. So have a think. I want you to reflect um, on on maybe. A, the last plumber you used, the last doctor you saw, uh, the last hairdresser you've used. Um, hopefully it wasn't in February. Um, hopefully you've seen one since then. Um, but think of those three individuals and think about the best one you've used, the very best plumber, the very best doctor, the very best hairdresser. Um, and think about how you feel about them. Um, and the question we could have done a bit of a shout out on if we were here and if we were around in, um, in person together is, my question is, what, what's common about the feeling that you have about those three very different um, individuals in the sense that they do very different uh, different services uh, for you, very different things? Um, and um, I think the answer, um, I hope the answer is um, they're all trusted. Um, and uh, if they're ones that you use and go back to again, um, uh, if it's any kind of professional service or any advice, um, the one of the most important things is that you have a feeling of trust in them. Um, and uh, this concept of uh, actively building trust with the decision makers you're working with is something that we found very useful. So um, lots of books on this, uh, probably the seminal, number, uh, seminal book is The Trusted Advisor by a guy called um, David Meister, um, who, um, uh, and this is very much key to kind of some of the thinking around classic consulting models, consulting tradecraft. Um, but trust uh, is something that um, that is kind of one of the most important uh, components of a client consultant relationship. And what Mason talks about is um, these different uh, components. He puts it into an equation. Um, he gets no marks for his maths. So uh, don't try and think about this as a mathematical equation, um, even though it's expressed as such. Um, but he talks about um, you build trust not through simply being an expert on what you do. It's more than that. It's wider than that. And, and if you're, if you think that um, somebody will trust me just because I am really good at this, um, you're probably making a bad mistake, and you're probably not building good trust with the decision makers you're working with. So he talked about credibility. So that is the expertise that you know what you're talking about, and you can demonstrate that they know what you're talking about. But he also talked about reliability. So you know, you said you were going to do something, and you did it. He talked about something called intimacy, um, which isn't as alarming as it sounds, but it really means is this can this person talk about difficult subjects with you do they do they start to volunteer things that um are maybe um uh more, more hard for them to talk about and actually helping people have conversations that are about difficult topics is a great way of building a deeper um uh, trusted relationship with the client and the last one probably the most important particularly when you might think this is a little bit about like playing politics and I don't think it is playing politics. I think it's important to be aware of politics, but intent, which was the, the other, the fourth part of that trust equation. Um, are you demonstrating to the person you're working with that what you're doing is in their, is in their good interests and you have their agenda mind and you're being transparent about your own agenda. And that thing can be, that can be incredibly important. And all those things, um, whilst they might sound quite subjective to a certain extent you can manage. So, so one of the things when you think about managing stakeholders, um, it doesn't have to be a big science project, but this kind of picture um, we would use with a lot of our teams, which would say for a particular project or a particular area of the business, where would you position the key sponsors in terms of how strong is their influence, i.e. how important it is that we get it right with them, um, and what's the strength of our trust with them? So how much do they trust us? And you can start to, by each person, kind of manage these credibility, reliability, um, intimacy and intent um, and and do things that um, actively uh, manage up that trust um, and so how do you put that together um, we found that the concept of the account team was very helpful here um, 
uh, obviously an account team for those of you who are in kind of consulting environments or have come from agency or consulting environments will kind of immediately understand what we mean. Um, and most of the others will have probably come across an account team. But the idea is we, we form particular teams of blended skills around certain areas of the business. And why is that important? Well, it creates a degree of continuity um, so you can afford to invest time in building trusted relationships. So it does take time to do this. Um, and there's no point in doing it for every project uh, and starting from scratch each time. So one of the things we did, so this kind of pushed us into a model that said, I'm going to actually put together sort of a bunch of people who are going to spend most of their time focused on this part of the business. We didn't hard organize that, you know, hard wire it into the organizational model, but we, we created teams that focused on a particular area or a particular problem or a particular part of the business. And that team kind of contained a tailor blend of skills. Um, so um, we, and we would have, as you would in sort of any kind of client consulting environment, account team reviews. What have you done recently? Uh, what are you going to do? What could we do? Um, and start teeing up areas where we could work. And we build pipelines around projects. But then most of all, and it comes to the next part, which I think is really important around how you get people to change their mind. We would build projects around choices. So why was that important? Well, um, I think it really helps shape quite fundamentally the kind of analytics work you do. So um, here's a really good example of a poor briefing that you can get if you're in an insights team or an analytics team which is um, give me some insight. Um, and this is kind of, this is semi real life because I think we semi got um, uh, requests like this, which is, hey, analysis team, can you tell me about the different segments of savings investors in our savings book or in our ISA book? Um, I just want to get some profiling done. Um, and this is a terrible brief and it's terrible for us as well as for the client because there's no way of knowing what, what's enough analysis. How do you know when you've done enough? How do you know when the profiles are right? So this is a misdirected kind of boil the ocean type of analytics and, and not good. A better briefing might be, give me a commercial model, for example, or give me some kind of business model. What's the best model we can use to target um, our investors in this period next year? So that's a bit more focused. It's good commercial objectives. So I can really start to judge whether or not the work I'm delivering is good. Um, but a better structure and one we try to encourage our projects to be built around was, um, Actually, what is wanted is the business wants to make a choice, right? The business wants to do something. Uh, we're coming up to ISA season. Um, we either want to intervene or we want to, so we want to intervene with a particular campaign that we did last year, or maybe we want to, don't, we want to do anything at all because we think if we just left everything alone, the business will flow in um, right away. We want to make a, we have a choice of things that we could do and we want to decide what the best choice is. So this is the best way of structuring um, some work for the analytics team is is orientated around a decision. Um, it really yields to I know I know when I've done enough. I've done enough when of the three choices I've had, it's clear which one I'm going to take, or I've got enough data that the um, client can can make the choice. But com framing the analytics around these commercial outcomes and these commercial choices, I think, is a really important step if you're going to help manage people in the decision making process. Bom, bom, bom. So we found a group of decision makers with a choice we want them to take. How do we help them take that choice? Um, this is one of my favorite films, 12 Angry Men. If you haven't seen it, go watch 12 Angry Men. It's black and white. It is really compelling. Um, I won't tell you the answer because I, I made the mistake. I made the mistake of doing that when I used this example at another talk and I explained the story and <laughs> somebody said the back, oh, spoiler. So no spoilers. Um, but I'll frame the story is um, Henry Fonda is on a jury um, and uh, they are to try to decide um, about a trial. And uh, um, the film follows, the film is one of the interesting things about the film is it's all within one single room, which is why it's an interesting, um, interesting film to watch with the exception of, I think the opening scene and the closing scene, which are outside the courthouse, the entire film was in within one room. And it was quite famous because it was shot from different angles in order to break up the, um, the narrative and break up the story um, and to create different scenes, but it's all within the one room. Anyway, the story, why is it relevant here? The story is about uh, Henry Fonda's on the jury um, and, and he goes through a really compelling process of helping shape the, the choices and the decisions made, made, made by the jury. Um, and it's a great example of facilitation rather than telling people what to do and, and he facilitates through a decision and to a certain extent I think this is this is what 
um, I would talk about when when you want to make people to make a make a um, make a choice. Um, it is not about doing the work, showing the work, and then say go away and do it. I think there's work to be done within the analyst team, within an analyst as a professional, um, to help facilitate uh, the client to make a choice. And why is that hard? Well, um, just go to Wikipedia and um, Google cognitive biases. Um, I counted, I'm sad that way, I couldn't count them. I counted over 200 um, different definitions of ways we can screw up our thinking. Um, Wikipedia captures into three different buckets, but the point is there are a lot of them. There are different ways that we can make decisions in the wrong way. And so it's not just about, did the answer tell me which choice or did the answer suggest a choice to make? Um, it's also because we, um, sometimes we can decision making. So um, how do we think, how do we decide? Again, um, and it goes a little bit back to um, uh, a base in behavioral economics. Um, there's been a lot of thinking about how we think. Um, two guys called uh, Amos Tversky and Daniel Kahneman wrote two very um, lengthy uh, tomes on um, uh, both behavioral economics and, and cognitive biases and how we uh, screw up our thinking. And then Kahneman then helpfully synthesized all of that thinking into a much more readable book called Thinking Fast and Slow. If you haven't come across Thinking Fast and Slow, I definitely recommend it to you. Um, uh, and he talks in there about system one and system two thinking. And system one thinking is essentially um, the thing that kept us being eaten when we were uh, when we were in prehistoric times. Um, it's the thing that makes us react suddenly to um, alerts and makes us think fast and act fast. And system two thinking is a thing you do when you drop into actually considering something and reflecting on it. Um, and um, uh, that's a sort of uh, rather dry way of describing um, what you and I might think of as gut feeling uh, versus uh, looking at data. But one of the reasons why I think this is very compelling and, and worth um, reflecting on is um, sometimes, or, or you know, you sometimes hear this sort of gut versus data as being a competition between the two. You know, oh, he's an intuitive business person. He takes decisions on his gut or this person's a deep data thinker. They only take decisions on the data. Um, I, both philosophies are wrong. And, and, and Tversky and Kahneman describe why, which is um, decisions that are complex, particularly business decisions or decisions made in, a, in, a, in government or making a policy decision involve some really complex trade-offs and involve some great synthesis of judgment. And, um, that is not susceptible to saying, let's rank all of the decisions and we'll pick the top one. Um, you rarely are going to get the blend of thinking uh, you want to do. So the most effective decision making uses both these methods, use both system one and system two thinking. Um, and the way you need to do that is um, you need to make sure you have invested time in understanding the data, thinking about the criteria that you're going to use to make the decision. And then, um, putting it all together in your head and making the, the synthesis. The synthesis decision, the gut decision, if you like, as an informed gut decision, as opposed to, um, uh, as opposed to simply taking a, a gut decision in the absence of data. So that involves a couple of things. It involves teaching um, data savviness to, 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 to clients um, uh, or to your decision makers. And, and that's hard to do. Um, and we did a number of different things in Barclays to try and do that. It wasn't an easy task, um, but it, and to overcome, to be able to read data well, to be able to consume data well, um, and to be able to um, interpret data without making some of these cognitive uh, biases. But then it also requires you to facilitate the dialogue, i.e. make sure that your decision makers have been exposed to the data in the right way, and then not tell them what the answer is because you don't often know the answer and there is no one answer. There's a judgment often to be made between, do I want to do A or B? That may not be, there's no one answer that the data will tell you. Um, it may be a synthesis of judgment that you want the decision makers to make. But it's part of, I think, uh, going back to the point of this talk, creating impact, you can create a huge amount of impact and create more impact if you can help facilitate that dialogue with your, with your client. Quick example. Um, and then we'll close. Um, uh, so going back to test and learn, uh, one of the things we wanted to do was kind of create that test and learn environment within parts of the business. And so I think this was a good example of the way we manage that process of uh, getting people to think and engage with the data. 
Um, this was with a kind of relatively newly formed management team for our premier banking business. Um, and the, the breakthrough was they, the fools they were, they invited us to come and teach them about data, um, which of course we would love to, love to have done. Um, so uh, so we, we, we got the uh, opportunity to kind of lecture them about data. Well, we didn't do that, thankfully. Um, what we did do was we took that opportunity to teach the business about the value of experimentation and some of the points I made earlier and that idea of that test and learn cycle. We kind of instilled in them, here's some ways to be data savvy around experimentation. And we then created um, uh, a facilitation mechanism. So we created a testing rhythm, there was a pipeline, uh, there was a um, structured way to create tests, um, structured way to introduce tests, and a set of review forums that then looked at the results of those tests as they, as they worked through the system. And what that did was um, it kind of stimulated system two and system one thinking. The formal review of all the testing outputs where you go into the session and actually start to read the test outputs and look at the, um, the impact and look at the ones that worked and the ones that didn't. That was a great way of stimulating system two. And then we can then facilitate the decision on do you kill this test, do you wait, do you roll it out, um, enable them to make a much more productive use of, um, of their system one, of their gut if you like. So, um, so how do you put that? So this kind of art and science of persuading decision makers, how do you put that into practice? Well, um, kind of point one, build decision, build teams around the decision makers of the organization, build projects around choices, equip decision makers with tools to engage with the data. That is not always self-serve. That is not always give them the data and tell them to go study the chart and come back when you're done. Um, sometimes it is, it is helping, it is, it is um, helping them manipulate the data such that, um, uh, you can bring certain things out. And, and I think from a, as, as analytic professionals and people providing analytic service into the business, that's something that uh, uh, we are well equipped to do. Um, then build really good data-driven objective, testable criteria around the choice to be made. It won't give you 100% of the choice. It won't give you the answer, but it'll give you that kind of data uh, uh, data basis for making a, making a sort of decision. And then facilitate the dialogue, uh, facilitate that decision-making moment and allowing kind of an informed gut to have a role. Okay, last few slides um, to close off. Um, some of you who may have come to this thinking art and science, data and, uh, and, and data-driven art and science, surely this talk is always gonna be about data visualization. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you. Um, and if that was what you were expecting, um, as I say, I do apologize. Data visualization is, is an awesome topic um, and one we should definitely do at some point. I'm probably not the best person to talk on it, but um, I'd give it a shot. Um, good data visualization is really important in this process and, and it is a whole uh, spectrum around the art, but um, I wasn't gonna spend time on it today. Last few words around how do you do this? Um, and again, to stimulate thought. Um, I think the starting point, we talked a lot about multidisciplinary approaches. So it's probably no surprise that one of the starting points is to decide which disciplines am I going to start to blend in my team. So we did a lot of explicit building of those disciplines into the teams. Um, they did a lot of their own development. We had um, pictures like this, uh, a sort of a, a set of competencies that we would build, that we would build our skills around, that formed roadmaps, um, competency standards that you could use for um, uh, you could use for uh, um, uh, performance management as well. And so you would hire, develop, and promote against uh, these kind of uh, descriptions of the skills you needed. And in general, we were looking for uh, what we call T-shaped um, career models or, or, or M-shaped career models, as some people used to, used to describe, who wanted more than one specialization. But you knew a lot about everything. You knew, you knew something about everything and, and everything about something. Um, and, and the process of, of managing the team was to actively manage rotations and project mix in order to create that, uh, create that development. Um, how do you do this? Uh, rich experiment, experiential training programs, um, which uh, was a, a great way of kind of teaching this stuff because it's quite an integrative skill set. So the only really way to make it teachable and testable is to do it in terms of action learning projects. So one of the best ways of, 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 of teaching this stuff was have live action projects and actually have live action projects that are relevant to the business. So the more useful they are, the better. And kind of the end point of this um, I did want to reflect on um, is um, 
we had a, a really great program at the end, which would which was partly about how do you make that shift from what what some of us might call traditional analysis to data science. And our answer to that question was um, start taking our population of analysts through a set of advanced advisory, advanced customer strategy, advanced analytics skills um, to kind of move them into a different uh, kind of level of um, level of analyst. Um, and uh, this was put together by the team. We ended up, um, uh, we ran it two years, uh, two years running before I left. Um, we graduated, uh, quotes graduated, got a double digit numbers of new data scientists. So people um, who had a, a pretty high skill set um, and were doing a lot of very cool stuff um, by the time they kind of emerged from this program. Um, but the two things that I think were really important about this and, and worth people taking away and reflecting on, because I'm sure this is very replicable in many places, the projects they chose in order to, quotes, learn their skills were real projects with high value impact on the organization. So you know, in the first year we did this, we had over a dozen, quotes, graduation projects, um, which are actually uh, really beneficial to feeding into uh, stuff we did with the, did with the business. So um, really high value, really high impact. Um, so you were both, you know, teaching, but, but, but delivering value at the same time. And the last thing to say is, um, and this I feel very passionate about, the reason I think it worked and the way, the reason it was, um, it stuck well was um, all of this was done by the team. So um, uh, this, none of this was me. This was the faculty was the team, um, the people teaching, um, doing lunch and learns, doing the, the sort of um, uh, creation of the courses, creation of the, the conferences we used to get together. All of that was um, done by kind of essentially volunteers, although they all got kudos for doing it, but, um, uh, all, all done by the team. So that not only made, I think, the, the teaching incredibly relevant and incredibly powerful, um, more importantly, um, uh, you learn yourself when you try and teach others. So it was a great way of kind of passing on that teaching. Um, uh, last thing, even Leonardo didn't always get it right. I won't tell the story of this, but this is the Last Supper, which sadly he, he tested uh, a new technology and um, when he painted the, the Last Supper, which is why it's gone through such restoration problems. Um, but uh, we could talk about that uh, in the Q&A if you're interested. And that's it. So what next? Um, as I said, I'm hoping it stimulate ideas. Um, we've uh, bombed through that at speed, um, although it's it'll take me over an hour to do it. So it um, just shows you I put too much together. Um, always one of my failings. Um, but if you lead an institution with analytics team, um, I would urge you to think about whether you're demanding the right things and are you engaging with them in the right way. If you lead an analytics team, hopefully this gives you some ideas to think about. And um, if this is your profession, then um, hopefully there's some ideas here about things you might want to do to extend your own palette of skills. Um, Anyway, any views on this, including what a load of tosh. Um, I knew all this already. Um, that's an hour of my life I won't get back. Even if that's your reaction, I would love to hear from you because that'll stop me doing it again. Um, but the stuff here you think was really powerful, I'd love to hear about that. And if the stuff you think is old hat and you do differently, I'd love to hear about that. So um, I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn, and on the email. I'd love to hear from you uh, after this event as well as in the next 20 minutes or so. Michael, back to you. Excellent, Nick. Thanks very much. Re really enjoyed that. I think uh, beneficial for all, uh, for people who are leading data and analytics team, but also for, for anyone in business. Yeah, I took a lot from it myself and about looking at building and growing and scaling teams and, and getting the most out of people. And you can see clearly uh, the reason why you've, you've managed to think, was, was your team around 140 when you left Barclays? Well, it, it, it's even bigger now, actually, um, because uh, there was one other analytics team built on the kind of same kind of principles, and we merged those just as I was leaving. So I think they're about 220 now. So, yeah, it's a big team. I think that's an example of, uh, the, you kind of told the story of and shared some of the secrets of how to build and, and grow and scale teams. As well, so that was that was excellent. Also, uh, I took a lot. I was listening uh, during lockdown over the past the, the past few months. The word "trusted advisor," I've I've I've, I've never heard it as as much as as I have over uh, over good. kind of lockdown. And again, yep. going back to to my own business, and I think a lot of, a lot of people are, are the way the market's been at the moment, and the, the the things that are going on are really looking at the kind of real quality over quantity and 
the professionalism and trusted advisor. So it's funny. It was nice. I took I took a note of your slide. It was it's a a word I've seen a lot. So it was nice to see it with it with the words going along there as well. So excellent, excellent. And and I mean, I think it's an interesting debate about how do you? I thought you were going to talk about how do you do that when you have got to do it through a Zoom screen. I I, yeah. I think it does make it harder. I think uh, there's probably a good discussion around. What are some techniques to better manage that? Particularly, I, I, I've just joined this this uh, uh, the Open Finance Center, and, and yeah. you know I'm I'm meeting a whole bunch of new people, both internal and my own internal team, and, um, and and externally. And of course, it's really hard to build those new relationships when you can't just have a coffee with somebody or uh, spend time in a room with them around a whiteboard. Definitely. Now there is a. Do you want do you want to go into the Q and A? There's there's one question I'm at, at the yes. moment. Uh, from, I, not in the chat. I want Q and A rather than chat. Got it. Uh, oh gosh, this is really good. Um, so the question is: everybody, Can everybody read this question? They can all jump in, can't they? So it's about preempting or altering customer behaviours. What's the time for predicted change to be observed or confirmed? Um, immediate days, weeks, months, um, and what improvements to the feedback delay were you able to make? So, so I think. Um, the first answer to that is going to be pretty unsatisfactory because it's going to be what you expect, which it kind of depends on the um, on the behaviour. Um, uh, rarely, I mean, well, you know, uh, you could argue some of our digital stuff it was immediate. Um, but the second question I think is really important: um, what improvements to the feedback delay you're able to make? So I, I think that is um, a core part of thinking about test and learn: is how can you reduce that cycle time? And actually, it's a great example of where. The team were able to use some new techniques. So I talked about Bayesian testing. So um, we did quite a bit of work where um, you can use Bayesian math to figure out how to retest uh, more quickly on less data than you might otherwise um, do. Um, and that was really effective way of, of, of speeding up that, um, that test and learn process. Um, that's a highly sophisticated way of doing it. And, and then you can actually have rather more mundane ways of doing it, like making sure your process is slick and making sure you're um, you can uh, you're productive in terms of uh, reading results. But it's a really good uh, point, which is one of the secrets of being effective at this is is speeding up that cycle time. Excellent, thanks, Nick. And I was I was actually I was I was hoping you could maybe touch a little bit more on when you were mentioning about teaching and influencing key decision makers within. Say a, a large organisation. Could you maybe maybe touch on a, a successful example you've had with that within an organisation you've worked in before? Um, so I mean, I, I think from a uh, consulting perspective, um, uh, one of the most successful examples where we we were rolling out a whole marketing. Uh, capability framework, which kind of took some of these ideas around analytics of segmentation and qual uh, study of, of segments. Um, uh, and we were trying to do it, um, uh, trying to get a consistency across the whole organization. And it was a global organization, so this was many, many different countries. Um, and I, I think the um, our process of carefully working with each board in each country and going through the kind of process I described of building trust, figuring out the choices they had to make, demonstrating um, how you could bring data to uh, bear on that choice and helping them make that choice, um, helped us really convert, not just answer a bunch of questions, but create a process by which the organization was able to answer those questions more productively. Um, yeah. time again, and it was a, I think it could be a very powerful way. And as I said, hopefully, um, the point landed. Some people think of this as a little bit Machiavellian, um, and I don't think of it as Machiavellian because yeah. um, it's understanding politics, but it's not kind of playing politics. Um, but you have to understand politics, you have to understand where people's intent and agenda are. But um, uh, from our perspective, I think being upfront and transparent with the client is what's important. Definitely. What was the average time frame for each project to the team? And what was a quick project and what was a long one? So that's a really interesting um, uh, question because I think. One of the process I talked about, this idea of moving a project from give me a bit of analysis to help me answer a choice, is obviously it extends the scope and length of the project. Um, and that can be quite deliberate. So, so the answer to your question is an average time frame. I think by the time we were sort of work through this was a project would be a couple of months. Um, and a quick project might be 
three weeks and a long project could almost last a year um, uh, in sense of if you're doing some big transformation. Um, for example, one of the things we did was we had to model the whole process of ring fencing. So when we split the bank up into the ring fence component uh, that was going to stand up in the UK and be in the ring fence bank, we actually had to model every customer that went from one side of the bank to the other. That was a huge job and, and, and we were at it for a good year that they were doing the, the ring fence planning. Um, so it really depends on the choice and the business decision being made. Um, but I think the, the important point here is um, the sort of takeaway, the generic answer is as you work through this process, I think the time frame goes up um, and that's a good thing because you're, you're working at the rhythm that the, the choice is being made, that the decision is being made and that's, that's, uh, that's important. Excellent. Uh, Miro, he's actually had to leave, but he's, 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 he's put something in chat saying it was a superb session. So thanks very much. But he, he, he think he will reach out to you direct on LinkedIn. But he is oh, yeah. asking about building trust within an organisation to accelerate knowledge sharing. Oh, sorry, was that a question? Yeah, it, 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 maybe, maybe we could touch on it quickly before we finish. Yep, yep. Uh... But I have a question on building trust within an organization to accelerate knowledge sharing. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm wondering whether he actually had a question about that or whether he had a, an idea. It looks like he got an idea on how to do that. Um, yeah, maybe. I think uh, uh, knowledge sharing is is actually I, I, is almost a whole other topic, Michael. It's, an, it's yeah, another no, topic. Uh, exactly <laughs> knowledge exactly management is one of the things that I think is, uh, again, really um, can yeah. be really valuable, particularly when you've got well-knit teams. Yeah. Um, because the one of the things you can do is is going to build on the results of one project. And yeah. one of the things that the team were doing, which was very effective, I don't know that it counts to Miro's point about yeah. knowledge sharing. But when I talked about the account teams, um, one of the most powerful things you could do is you could go to the mortgage business and say, "Here's what we've been doing with business banking," um, uh, and and so you could use the results and the impact of one project to stimulate interest and ideas in another. And that actually kind of accelerated, assuming each project was beneficial to the organization, and they normally were, um, that allowed you to kind of accelerate the impact of those. That, would, that could be a good topic for another one, Nick. That's one we could, we could certainly talk around. Nick, I don't think there's any more questions, but Excellent. I'd just like to thank you again. That was, that was brilliant. I'll send you over the recording straight away as well, and hopefully we can share that with the rest of the community. But That'd be good. thanks very much. That's everything. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for listening. Good Thanks everyone you. for listening. Thanks very much. Bye. Cheers. Bye.